Sandy van Dijl tak hoofd by Alexander Forbes Health. Keir van ochend saam om oor mediese fondse en wachttijdperke te gesels. So good morning Sandy and thank you so much for joining us. Morning Elsa, thank you so much and thank you for having me. Sandy, I would like to start by asking why does the medical scheme apply a waiting period? So I think what's important for us to start off with, and it'll give a great or a good understanding in terms of waiting periods, is in the South African context of a medical scheme, when a person applies to join the medical scheme and they make that application, the medical scheme may not decline or deny that member uh, on their application. So they must accept that member uh, and that member can become a member of the medical scheme. The other thing that's also important is that when we join a medical scheme, contributions that we pay are what we commonly refer to as community rated. So that means if we take two members, they join the medical scheme, they have the same family composition, composition they will pay the same premium. So that means no matter whether I have you know, a worse health status or a better health status, depending on the two members as the example that I've used, the premiums that we pay will then be exactly the same. So they cannot discount my premium because I'm a really good and healthy member, or they cannot load or increase my premium because of my health status. Mm -hmm. So in that context, a medical scheme then has only two mechanisms or a mechanism that they can use in terms of um, you know, protecting their risk pool and, and uh, accepting members onto the medical scheme. And they do that by imposing waiting periods on members that join. <clears throat> All right. Now, does, does different waiting periods apply to different individual situations? So, yes, they do. I think, you know, to simplify, there are three categories in which a member may, um, you know, fall into when a medical scheme is applying or looking to apply a waiting period. The first thing that they will look at on application is, has the member been a member of a medical scheme prior to them joining? Okay, so that's the first thing that they check. If a member has not been a member of a medical scheme before, or they were a member of a medical scheme, but their break in membership was longer than 90 days, then they fit into a certain category and a certain amount of or, or underwriting is applied to that member. There's another category which then says, if a member has been on a medical scheme 24 or less than 24 months and their break in membership has not been longer than 90 days, then there are waiting periods that apply, certain waiting periods that apply to that member. Mm. Then thirdly, they say, if you are a member and have been a member of a medical scheme, your membership has been longer than 24 months and you have had, not had a break in membership of more than 90 days, then there are waiting periods in that example or that category that will apply to a member. So there are different categories in which a member will fall into and there are certain waiting periods that will be applied in each of those categories. Sandy, another frequently asked question. Um, may I claim any benefits during the waiting period and why or why not? So because there are different waiting periods, we'll talk about a three-month general waiting period uh, as in this conversation, and then we'll also talk about the 12-month pre-existing condition-specific waiting period. So when I have a three-month general waiting period, I'm still required to pay my medical scheme contributions, and I, during that general waiting period, may not claim for benefits. Okay. So I have no access to benefits, but I do need to pay my premium. I think what is important to understand is that, you know, I've come into the medical scheme, I'm now having to pay contributions, and in order for me to get access to benefits, there are a certain amount of contributions or um, value in contributions that I need to pay before I'm able to access my benefits if I get a three-month waiting period. If I get a 12-month pre-existing condition-specific waiting period, then that is a waiting period that extends much longer, and that means that the conditions for which the medical scheme have applied a waiting period, I don't have access to those uh, particular benefits for the full 12 months of my membership. Mm. I think also what's important to clarify here in terms of these waiting periods is that depending on the categories that I spoke about earlier, Prescribed minimum benefits may be applicable to a member 
in category two. So that is the category that I had less than 24 months, but, but I have not had a break in membership of 90 days, or I've had cover for longer than 24 months, and my break is not longer than 90 days, then the member applies, that applies, gets access to the prescribed minimum benefits. Those, those are benefits that members must have access to. So those are emergency or life-threatening situations, and there are uh, chronic conditions that, fo that form part of those prescribed minimum benefits. Mm. And do I still have to pay the monthly fee during the waiting period, even if I cannot claim benefits? Yes, you do. Um, remembering that part of the contribution that we pay as medical scheme members goes towards the scheme reserves. So, you know, part of that premium that I'm paying goes to the reserves. And in order for me to start contributing to those reserves, as well as the waiting period that gets applied to me, I cannot claim benefits during that three-month waiting period. Mm. Sandy, I'm looking forward to the rest of this interview. So, you can be happy for the rest of this gesprek. Ons gaan nou voort met vanochtend een gesprek met Sandy van Dijl, takhoofd bij Alexander Forbes Health, wat saamkeer om oor medische fondse en wachttijdperke te gesels. So thanks again for joining us this morning, Sandy. Thank you, Elsa. Now, Sandy, when can a medical aid not apply a waiting period? So I think there are two distinct ways that or reasons where a medical scheme may not apply a waiting period. And that is firstly, when I register a newborn baby. So I apply to the scheme, I register my newborn baby and on registration of that baby, no waiting periods may be applied to the addition of that, of that dependent. I think what is important to note, however, is that it, medical schemes have a time period in which you have to register that newborn baby. If you choose not to do it within that time period, and you choose later on to add that child dependent or that baby, then waiting periods may apply to that application that you make. Secondly, as a medical scheme member, we get an option to make uh, changes to our, our medical scheme options at least once a year. And on that option change, uh, the medical scheme may not underwrite me when I make that option change. So I may be on a lower option this year and based on my health status or what my requirements are for the following year, I'm required to upgrade my option. On that choice of upgrade, I may not be underwritten uh, when I make that particular choice. And what happens if or when I don't pay my medical aid? So we must remember that, we, you, you know, we pay a premium in return for benefits. And... You know, for whatever reason, members may then not be able to, to meet their obligation in terms of their medical scheme contributions. Medical schemes on non-receipt of contributions will suspend a membership until such time as a member has paid back the premium that is outstanding. Again, there are time periods that apply, and if a member just chooses not to pay the premium, their membership will be cancelled, and if they then want to go back to the medical scheme at a later stage and want to rejoin the medical aid, then waiting periods to that membership will be applied. So in other words, a medical aid can cancel your membership? Yes, they can on non-receipt of, of, your, of your premiums. But I do want to state that medical schemes will do whatever they can to reach out to the member in terms of those outstanding premiums before they just merely go ahead and, and cancel the membership. Mm -hmm. But membership initially will be suspended and then failing the payments of any outstanding medical scheme contributions, your membership will be withdrawn. Sandy, are there any tips and important questions uh, to ask your medical aid that you can share with us this morning? So there are, I think it's very important that when you are joining a medical scheme that you're very clear about the underwriting or the terms and conditions of your acceptance. So when applying, medical schemes will give you their decision upfront and it will give you the opportunity to then review the decisions of, of your acceptance and then you're free to, to join the medical scheme or, you know, or not join the medical scheme. The other important thing is that you know, financial advisors play an important role to help members to navigate through a fairly complex environment and they can help members to, to determine the underwriting that's applicable, 
you know, whether prescribed minimum benefits are applicable to them. Um, you know, advisors can help them to, to do that. It's also important just to mention that a health advisor doesn't come as an additional premium to a medical scheme member. So their premium that they pay the medical scheme is not dependent on whether they have an advisor or not. So it is important for somebody to reach out to, to a specialist or an expert to help them navigate that field. Platforms that they make available. So, you know, there are mobile apps, there are obviously websites. It's a great way for a member also to touch in, uh, get in touch with a medical scheme, also be in control of their medical expenses, what's happening within their medical scheme. Uh, they can also submit claims through those various um, apps or, or websites, uh, and it allows you to, to really be in touch with what's happening in terms of your medical scheme. And then also just remember to check with the medical scheme when you are applying in which category you fall and whether those prescribed minimum benefits are applicable to you. They are important benefits and they are benefits that are available to members um, where they are applicable on the um, application or when joining the medical scheme. And then I don't know if this might be a difficult question, but are there any so-called most common mistakes that people make when deciding on a medical scheme or aid? Um, yes, I think, unfortunately, and I think we've seen through COVID, uh, the need for people to obviously review their cover. You know, people have been uh, adversely affected through COVID and many people need to hang on to the medical scheme cover that they've got. Um, so, and also they've got to balance the affordability uh, in terms of maintaining that sort of cover. Unfortunately, sometimes we do find that members will buy the a medical scheme based on the price that they pay, not fully understanding that what you pay for is what you get. Uh, there are no such thing as free lunches, and you're not going to get full extensive benefits on a medical scheme for a small premium that you're paying versus somebody that's paying a much higher premium. So there are common mistakes people buy based on price, and it's very important, we think, for a member to, to structure their cover based on what their needs are and then try to balance that with what they can afford. And how often does this revision need to take place? And, and do I need to review the, the certain benefits and the, and, and the plans available? So medical scheme members, as I mentioned earlier, get the option to review their medical scheme cover once a year. Mm -hmm. That generally takes place round about October, November of the year. So medical schemes will start sending out communication to various of their medical scheme members to let them know that there will be contribution changes and there will be benefit changes. It's at that point that it becomes very, very important for a member to review their options. We say to a member, you should be doing that at least once a year. Depending on the year that you've had, taking into consideration some of the treatment that you may require going forward, that is the opportunity that you get to make sure that you're adequately covered for the year ahead. If you choose not to make that revision, what generally happens is, is that when you, when you don't review and things that you should have taken into consideration when making that option change, come back to bite you later on because then you may discover that the benefit that are actually needed may or may not be covered on the option that I've chosen. So you should, as a rule, review that medical scheme cover at least once a year. Mm. Sandy, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, I think we've learned a lot. Thank you, Elsa, and thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Goed, dit was dan Sandy van Dijl van Alexander Forbes Health, wat vanochtend met ons gesels het oor medische fondse en die wachttijdperk wat daarmee gepaard gaan. Kom ons gaan groen.